Testing, 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 testing. Recording. All righty, so thank you very much for joining me. I'm so excited to have you here today. Um, the webinar today is going to be talking about how to slow your Parkinson's down. And essentially it's going to be elaborating on 10 key points that I believe will be able to help you slow your Parkinson's down. Now it will be a fairly informal webinar because I know there's so much content out there already that you can access. Um, what I really wanna do is make sure that I answer your questions. So if you see the chat box um, down below, what I'd love you to do is actually make sure that you put any questions in the chat box. If you pop them in the Q&A over here, I probably won't see them because I've got the chat box open at the moment. Um, so if you can go ahead and put your comments in there, that would be great and I can answer them as we go through the, the presentation. So the first thing I want to talk about is to put the, the talk into context because I've been working in the area of helping people with Parkinson's for over 18 years now and I think what's the most exciting thing to me is the last five years and what's happened in the last five years because it's completely changed this um, diagnosis of Parkinson's from being all about doom and gloom to something where it's something you have to live with as a chronic condition and you can typically live very well with it. But I think the gap is that people don't know how to live their life as well as they possibly can. And so there's still this mentality that being diagnosed with Parkinson's means that um, there are now suddenly limits set on what you can and can't do. Um, your perception of running out of time, running out of control is definitely what I hear from a lot of my patients. And so what I'd really like to do today is take you from that sense of doom and gloom, if that is something that you have, all the way over to knowing that this is something you've got, you can handle this, you can really excel in your life um, just with a couple of key points. So that's what I'd really like to do today. And uh, in saying that, going through any of the questions that you do have around that. Um, the concepts that I'll talk, be talking about, they're not, um, it's not rocket science, but I think it's still really um, overlooked. And one of the key points will be around exercise and how uh, underestimated exercise is for you. So um, if you don't feel that Parkinson's is a diagnosis of doom and gloom, then I think you're starting from a really good baseline. And I'm really hoping that we can get you excited about the potentials and opportunities that you have available to you afterwards. Um, just in case you don't know who I am, my name is Melissa McConaughey. I'm a physiotherapist and I specialise in neurological physiotherapy, specifically Parkinson's disease. And I founded the PD Warrior Program back in 2012. We've, we've now helped about 20,000 people globally. Uh, it is based on the latest science and that's what I want to be talking to you about today so that you can get up to speed with um, the theory behind exercise, the, the neuroscience behind why it is so imperative that you're exercising in the right fashion. So this is ultimately what I want to take you to. So some of my patients have, you know, they've said to me at point of diagnosis that they felt that their body was failing them. I don't know if that resonates with any of you. Um, and I guess what I see from the background and what's going on at the level, at the cellular level, is that your body's not failing you at all. The fact that the majority of your dopamine producing cells have already perished by the time you actually have those clinical symptoms tells me how amazing your body is. And you need as much help as you possibly can um, well, you need to give your body as much help as it possibly can to um, repair itself and just um, be able to uh, move better and think better and feel as well as you can. Now, I just saw a hand go up. I'm just going to see if I can check out who did that. Christine, was that you that raised your hand or was that just in error? If you've got a question, can I just ask you to pop it over in the um, chat box um, down? You'll see chat down the bottom there. Just pop your question in there and I'll get towards it. So it's really exciting. As I said, it's the, it's the most exciting time in Parkinson's that I've ever been, um, I've ever seen. And the results that we're getting now in helping people with Parkinson's and what we can do for you is incredible. I think, you know, we've had pe people come in who, uh, have been out about to give up their jobs, they've been falling on a regular basis, they've lost their confidence, and to be able to see them 10, 12, 13 weeks later, almost leaping out of the gym, they're you know planning to stay on at work another 12 months, they're not falling anymore. These are the sorts of results that we see clinically, but from a quality of life perspective, it's, get, it's getting back to life. And we often talk about this brave list and creating this brave list. Um, and that really um, is around creating a bucket list mentality. So what is it that you want to get out there and do? Because you the, you mentally are the ones that are putting limits potentially, but your body actually has enormous capacity given the right framework to work and operate under. 
All right, so let's go into some of the clinical content. So the first one I was talking about before is that point of diagnosis. We know that the majority of your dopamine producing cells have actually perished. And these are the cells that sit in a particular part of the brain. Your basal ganglia sits in about the midbrain. Um, and within there, you've got a little group of cells in the substantia nigra pars compacta. And for reasons that we still don't know about, those cells start to perish. And they can start to perish a long, long time before you start to exhibit clinical symptoms. Now, there is some theories around genotypes, so whether it's a genetic predisposition to Parkinson's, there may then be in another, another environmental trigger that triggers it off. Um, but what we do know is that the majority of those dopamine producing cells once they reach a threshold of about 50 to 70% of those producing cells, there's not enough dopamine within the system anymore to modulate other neurotransmitters. And that's when you start to exhibit these motor symptoms. But you might have experienced loss of smell, um, constipation, autonomic, other, auto, auto, other autonomic symptoms like temperature regulation. You might have experienced those anywhere from five to 20 years prior to these clinical symptoms. And that's why I think your body is absolutely amazing to think that you've lost the majority of a particular type of cell that produces a very specific neurotransmitter and your body is still moving and operating extremely well until that particular threshold. And even then it tends to be a slow um, progression in Parkinson's, particularly if you're keeping yourself moving and active. So here you can, oh, sorry, here you can see this motor threshold here, where you start to see these motor symptoms at that point of diagnosis. And as we know, it is a clinical diagnosis, so there's no blood test or MRI or anything that will actually designate that you've got Parkinson's disease but it will be diagnosed clinically. So that point of diagnosis can be really arbitrary. It can be at that point when you've actually taken yourself off to the physician. And then when you actually start taking the medication and, and it's given a differential diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And then you see this progression of non-motor symptoms and Parkinson's is almost being redefined as a neuropsychiatric condition because of the role of those non-motor conditions. So what we're gonna talk about today is not just the motor symptoms, but also how we can improve the non-motor because those are just as important and can definitely uh, impact on your quality of life as well. And that's why I'll, as I come to the end of the presentation, I really want you to get started in, in a, a program like this or particularly PD Warrior as soon as possible because time is life, it's quality of life. And if you're not doing this style of exercise and not giving yourself and your body the best chance to improve, then you're really um, likely accelerating the symptom progression and reducing quality of life potentially reducing social um, participation activities as well. This is um, a study that was presented in 2013. This was Lord and colleagues. And the reason I bring this up is a lot of people at diagnosis are not helping themselves. So what this study showed was that at diagnosis, people were actually moving 30% less than their healthy age match control. So that's people without Parkinson's. 30% less is, is really significant. So they were starting to become sedentary. So just have a think about yourself now. I'm not sure how long ago it was that you were diagnosed, but how much um, activity are you doing now compared to pre-diagnosis? What is it that's limiting you? Is it a self-belief or is it a physical limitation with your activity levels? Um, is there some way that you can start moving a little bit at a time and increasing that dosage of, of exercise? Because it's really important. Um, there's lots of animal studies um, showing us that if, if animals that are induced with Parkinson's, it's not quite the same as uh, idiopathic Parkinson's in humans, but if they are induced with Parkinson's and then immobilized, their Parkinson's symptoms progresses and accelerates rapidly compared to mice um, and other animals that are allowed to immobilize and, um, independently. And we certainly start to see that in human studies as well now, although it's not with as much rigor because we obviously can't, um, it's typically frowned upon to autopsy uh, people after an intervention, but we can certainly see that um, sedentary behavior patterns are very, very bad for acceleration of your symptom progression. And it also doesn't help if you um, are sedentary because that can often lead to sedentary, uh, sorry, secondary comorbidities like cardiovascular problems, diabetes, metabolic conditions, respiratory problems. And really, you don't need anything else in addition to an, one chronic disease to really limit quality of life. So this was further supported by another study in 2011, really showing that people with Parkinson's were not mobilizing enough and they were less active than healthy age match controls. And this was in the very early stages where mobility issues were not likely to be the cause of that. So what I'd like you to do now is to think about your activity levels and is there a way that you could start to increase your activity levels. Um, and this was just a study that looked at um, 
activity decline as people progress through Parkinson's disease. So typically in Parkinson's, there are five stages called Hone and Yar. Stage one is where you're typically diagnosed, you're moving re relatively well, side, um, affected mainly on one side. Stage two is when you start to be affected on both sides. These are very broad terms in the definition and classification. Stage three is when you start to experience postural instability, um, falls or a lot of near misses. Um, and then stage four is when you start to require assistance um, in daily activities and daily living. And basically what they were showing in this um, study here is that by stage two, people were already 13% less active um, than people in stage one, and then 21% less active than people in stage one by stage three. And then there was a really significant drop off by about stage four. But my point is none of this is inevitable. None of this is inevitable. Yes, Parkinson's is a chronic condition, and yes, um, the lack of dopamine and the dopamine deficiency in the, in the brain will have a knock-on effect with motor symptoms, but it tends to be the sedentary behaviour patterns that really exacerbate um, mobility and, and physical activity uh, limitations in the first two or three stages. By stage four, what we'd like to do is slow that down, um, and we do that by working at the level of the impairment specifically. So in Parkinson's, what we're talking about is bradykinesia, which is the slow and small movements um, often characterised in Parkinson's disease, tremor dominance, uh, and then the postural instability that we see as well. So all of those things, that, that decline is not inevitable, um, but it is if you don't get into an exercise program that's targeted specifically for Parkinson's disease. All right, so let's talk about the 10 tips to slow your Parkinson's down. We've put it in context now, so let's go through the first couple. So the first one is about being brave. And I know this might seem a little bit random to start with, but it really does take courage and it does take bravery. You need to be bold to make the step to commit to a program, specifically an exercise program that is likely to be challenging. And the reason I say that is because if the program's not challenging, both physically and cognitively, it's probably not going to have the same results and, and it's not going to be as effective for you. And I say this through thousands of, of people that we've trained and experienced um, this program through without the world, around the world. It needs to be at a level where you're working extremely hard, very consistently. So we talk about working on a 10 uh through a 10 week challenge because it's all about building up really good exercise behaviors, routines, habits, and getting yourself into peak physical and cognitive condition. So the first thing is about being brave, making that decision to commit to yourself that you're going to be the best that you can be at every stage of this condition. Um, and you know, if it's a little overwhelming to start with, just think about that analogy with the elephant. If you go to eat an elephant, you, are, you, you start with the first bite. And that's always the first thing is taking that very first step. So the first step for you might be being brave and making the decision that you want to be the best that you can be at every stage of this, condi of this condition. Nothing is inevitable for you. Um, and thinking about it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. It's a really harsh term uh, and it comes out quite hard. But I think at the end of the day, Parkinson sucks, but it's not the worst thing that you could have. And typically in Western society now, you don't die of Parkinson's, you live with it. But how well you live with it is entirely up to you. So, you know, it used to be that you just take medication, um, your mobility and cognition would typically decline and that was just the way that it went. But that's not how, that's not how it should be. That's not what we, we, we can do better than that now. So I think it is your responsibility to take accountability for how you want to live your life. And I think at the end of the day, life is not a dress rehearsal. This is your one crack at it. Um, let's try and make it as, as good as it possibly can be by using every lever available to you to improve your quality of life, improve the way that you move, the way that you think and the way that you look. It is your responsibility to do that because nobody else can do that for you. And taking medication alone is just not good enough. It's a really good start, but it's not enough to give you back the quality of life and the control that you actually need. So I often get this question from a lot of people that it sounds good and I want to do it, but I don't really think I can. I, I don't exercise currently or I don't think I've got enough support or I don't have the time, I don't have the motivation or the confidence. And these are all really valid points. But, you know, go back to that elephant analogy. You've just got to start somewhere and, and it's just taking that very first step to be brave, to connect to yourself, that you want more for yourself, um, that it's not just good enough to just... Um, let the, the symptoms take over and lose your control and lose what you like doing in life. Think about the limits that you've possibly set on yourself already. I mean, I've, 
I've had people come in telling me they can't do X, Y, and Z, and then within two or three weeks they've walked out going, man, I've smashed that. I can totally do that. And now I'm actually going for these huge goals. So I know you can do this. I know you can do this despite all the barriers that you might put up in front of yourself. The first thing you, just, you need to do is just say, I just need to do one thing and take that first step to commit, my, commit to myself. Um, other people might say, I'm too old or I've had Parkinson's for too long. And look, what we know now is the sooner you start with a program like this, the better you'll be because the window of reversibility of cl clinical symptoms, the window of slowing down your symptom progression is best in the earlier stages of Parkinson's. But it doesn't mean that if you're stage three or four that you can't make significant changes. And I've actually got a video to show you later of a, of a lady that I worked with who had outstanding results as a stage four, which meant she was falling about 10 to 15 times every day. She needed assistance for pretty much every activity of daily living during the day. So getting in and out of bed, on and off the toilet, all of those things. And by the end of the program, you'll just see how, how, how much it improved by. So it's never too late, but the sooner you start, definitely the better. And that's why I don't want a day to go by that you don't pick up a program like this when you have that knowledge behind you. So it's really important that that doesn't become your excuse. So the second point is to build your team. Now, I recently came back from the WPC conference in uh, Kyoto in Japan, which is the World Parkinson's Congress. They have that um, conference every three years. And what was amazing to me and made me really realise how, how grateful I am to live in Australia and if you're in the US likewise, that you have access to an amazing medical team. And I think if you've got the access, please take that up because the more support you have, the better you are going to be able to live your life. So here's examples of some of the people that you might have in your team. So it might be your uh, movement disorder specialist, your neurologist, your physician, who's actually supporting you with the medication and some of the education. Physio, obviously, for the role of exercise prescription, occupational therapist for cognition, um, for training of um, daily activities, making life a lot easier for you, keeping you as independent as possible. Speech pathologist, if you've noticed that some of your vocal um, volume and projection has actually diminished or for um, fluency of, of language as well. Parkinson's nurse and nutritionist. These are some of the, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the people that you would have in your team. And I think it's really important that you reach out and have um, connections with people well before issues start. So if you are in the really early stages of Parkinson's, that's fantastic. Let's keep you moving and thinking and feeling as good as you possibly can for as long as you possibly can. And so that means finding your team and getting in touch with them sooner rather than later before the issues arise. So when they do arise, they're addressed immediately. And that can, you know, that can really um, limit the, the impact that it has on, on your life. Um, the second thing, sorry, the third point is to get your baseline measures. Now, this is very clinical, but we often talk about outcome measures being um, some of the movement, um, the ways that we can characterize your movement, putting parameters around your walking, the um, fluidity of your movement, movement um, gait variation, which might be a predictor of falls, postural instability, how far you can walk your overall endurance. Um, if you're freezing or a pre-freezer, which means your feet are starting to get stuck to the floor, which also can be predictive of falls. Is there um, difficulty with thinking and processing at a rate rapid enough to be functional in the community, all of those sorts of the things that we would be addressing in an initial assessment, just to see how, how you react, what your um, postural stability and agility was like. All of these things are things that are really important markers for us to help tailor and program your exercise program specifically for you. Um, and I think what is really important and really exciting in the program is once you get started with getting your base, baseline measures, you'll be amazed at how much you can improve on those baseline measures. So the first thing is getting the motivation from improvements. And I say that because in Parkinson's now with the research we have available, it's no longer just about use it and um, use it. Sorry, I'm getting myself confused now. Use it or lose it. It's no longer that. We've moved to the next step, which is use it and improve it. And that's why we say you should expect to improve on a program like 10 week, um, like Pity Warrior. You should expect to be significantly better in most aspects of your life at the end of the 10 week challenge. That's how confident we are with the literature and the, the approach that we have now. So getting your baseline measures is really important because you've got the beginning, you've got the end. Um, and then what we'd like to do is to continue those review sessions on. Like you go to the dentist every six months. Well, you should be going to the dentist every six months. It's the same with physiotherapy and exercise prescription. You need a new exercise program 
regularly so that you're still focusing on the things that are important to you and important to how your body moves at that particular point in time. The regular reviews are really important so that we can keep on top of things if they're starting to change. So baseline measures is really important and you can do that with a um, health professional directly. You can do it with our online coaching program, um, but you need to get your baseline measures. And the other really important thing that we like to do is get a challenge task. So if I had to ask you now, what is the one thing that bothers you the most as an activity during the day? Most days of the week, it bothers you. It's a bit for some people it might be rolling in bed really bothers you. It's hard to roll, so it wakes you up. It, it leads to poor sleep at night. It's, you might need to call somebody to help you or you can't get out of bed independently. You can't get out of a low surface like a low couch or chair. Um, it could be doing up your buttons, lots of different things. But just have a think about it now. What is the one thing that bothers you the most during the day? And what I'd suggest is that also becomes a baseline measure that you can track over time, especially as you start doing a program like this, to see how that improves. And then as you maintain. So, you know, those are the sorts of things that I'd be talking about there. So if you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat box there now so I can see them or any challenge tasks or things that bother you specifically. I'd love to see what they are. So please feel free to go ahead and pop them in the chat box there now. All right, now you might also be thinking, oh, I've got this already. I'm, I'm exercising regularly, I eat well, I get as much sleep as I possibly can, all of these sorts of things. So why would I need to be doing a tailored exercise program? And the reason I counter that is I often say, well, let me have a look at you. Let's have a look at what you've actually changed in your life already. You might not have noticed it. What have you compensated for already? Um, as I said, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of people now, and I think I can only think of three that we weren't actually able to really assist at that point in time because they were so newly diagnosed that there wasn't really anything that we could assist with. And even then my comment to them was, well, you are doing extremely well right now. Let's keep you there where you are at the moment. But if you've got this already, I'd still say that we can tweak your exercise program more so that's specific for Parkinson's and then again, more specific for you and the way that your impairments present. Um, and try and keep you moving as well as you possibly can. We know now that exercise is incredibly powerful at the cellular level, um, at changing the electrical activity within the brain, and it can have a systemic effect throughout the body. So exercise alone can be extremely powerful, and in some cases as powerful as major neurosurgery, which is the deep brain stimulation that some people have. So exercise can't be an underestimated, but it has to be exactly the right kind of exercise for you, and not just a generic walking around the block regularly, walking, taking the dog for a walk or going to the gym. Those are not gonna be enough to create the changes that I'm talking about. So when we talk about tailoring your exercise program, what I'm talking about here is um, looking at the type of Parkinson's that you have. So this is kind of the first step that we go through. So if you're bradykinesic, which is um, if slowness and smallness is, is the thing that bothers you the most, then we would start to tailor your program specifically around increasing the amplitude and the scale of your movement, um, looking at symmetry from left and right, um, really looking to exaggerate the movements that you have and train you to do that in more of an automatic function. So um, some people will complain about having difficulty pulling a sweater or a cardigan on because the movements are slow and small. So it would be about showing you how to use increased scale to really bring that sweater on. If you've got shuffling of gait or a narrowed base of support, again, we'd be trying to train some automaticity to increase your stride length, reduce gait variation, which is where one leg is stepping longer or shorter than the other one. Um, again, to increase um, the ability for your foot clearance so that you're not likely to be tripping on things. These are the sorts of things that we'd be looking for in bradykinesia. If you're tremor dominant, then we'd be looking more at forced use activities. So um, treadmill training, obviously, you, the treadmill waits for no man. If you, you know, if you stop walking on the treadmill, you'll end up wrapped around whatever piece of equipment is standing behind you. So forced use and augmented training is really important for your exercise program as well. High effort. So as I said before, um, the exercise that's going to be of most use for you is high effort, which is not necessarily cardiovascular effort. So we're not asking you to run marathons. Um, and in fact, we've got a lot of people that come in that have been running marathons are extremely fit but they're still not working at a specific level for their Parkinson's disease. So we need to tailor it so it's about motor output. And motor output is basically the, the brain's um, drive to the limbs. 
essentially. So your brain says, I want to move my arm and you move your arm. But with Parkinson's, it might be underscaled, it might be small in amplitude, and it may not have enough effort and motor output to actually drive a functional movement. So things become slower and smaller. Um, and with tremor dominance, what we're really trying to drive and improve is um, activity and cellular, cellular and electrical activity at the brain. And we can only do that with intensive exercise. So when we're talking about intensive exercise, it's about 80% of motor output, not cardiovascular. So if I gave you a really quick demonstration now, if you can see my hands, if I push my hands forward like this, that's not a lot of effort for me to do that at the moment. I'd probably put that on a scale of one to 10 as about a one. But if I increase my effort, you can start to see Although there's an increase in speed, there's also an increase in drive. And so I'm actually recruiting a lot more muscles and a lot more power. And that's what we're talking about with motor output. So that's what we'd specifically be working around with tremor dominance. And then agility impaired, if, if, that's, um, if that sounds like you, so if you're falling frequently or you're having lots of near misses or you're freezing, and that's actually leading to falls as well. Um, typically, that's related to a difficulty with weight shift, so getting weight from the left foot to the right foot, so your feet get glued and stuck there. Um, it, it often will be leading to falls. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is train your agility, train your capacity to weight shift quickly, rapidly, to respond to perturbations or um, things that are happening outside of your body. So typically this will be really problematic if you're in a shopping centre, it's really busy, noisy, there's lots of activity. Um, you've got to negotiate people, shopping trolleys, all sorts of things. This might be really overwhelming. So this is typically where we'd be looking at improving agility, weight shift. Um, obviously falls prevention comes into that as well and improving postural stability. So have a think about what type of Parkinson's you are at the moment. So bradykinesic, tremor dominant or agility impaired. Sometimes you might kind of cross, a, cross over between one or two categories and that's fine. Um, but that's usually the starting point of what you'd be um, tailoring your exercise program around. Um, all right, now train, train brave. So this is point five, and this is about training specifically for your type of Parkinson's. So um, it's really important that general exercise is just not going to cut it. And uh, we, once a week exercise is not really going to cut it. It has to be a specific program to really improve the way that you move. And with a long-term projection, we're, here, we're really here for the long game. Parkinson's is a chronic condition. It's degenerative. Um, so although we can't take that Parkinson's away, what we really want to do is to slow it down, to give you the best quality of life and the best chance to move as well as you can at every stage of that condition. So that's why we talk about training Brave for a 10-week period. What we really want to do in that 10 weeks is show you how to move well, um, think well, get as fit as you possibly can, but also embed some of those really good exercise behaviours and routines. So by the end of the 10 weeks, you've gone back to doing whatever activity that you enjoy um, you've got your network and, and people around you, you're committed to exercise for the rest of your life and you know how to move well. Um, and you've got the education supporting you. You have that underlying theory and awareness of, of what you need to do and why it's so important. And these are some of the crucial aspects that we teach over the 10 week challenge so that you do come out of it looking, feeling, thinking as well as you possibly can at the end of that 10 week challenge. So it's really about training brave. You do need to work hard, which is why um, the very first step is, is making the decision to commit to yourself, to be brave, take the, the be courageous and take that very first step. So what we're really looking at here at the moment is a paradigm shift. So this is just a breakdown of the decades where we saw some major revolutions in how Parkinson's was ma managed. So back in the 1960s, we see that levodopa was introduced. Now, my, my grandfather actually died of Parkinson's back in the 60s. Now, I never met my grandfather, but I know from stories that my grandmother's told me that, that it was really challenging in the last few years of his life because levodopa wasn't widely available in rural Australia back then. Now, because of levodopa and all the various different um, iterations that it comes in, Parkinson's is something you typically live with. Okay, so that was the very first and very exciting revolution in how Parkinson's was managed. And it really did um, change it from being essentially a, a long-term um, degenerative terminal condition to what it is now, which is something you live with. The next revolution we saw was deep brain stimulation, but it still remains only available to a very small portion of the population. There's only about 10 to 15% of people with Parkinson's that are eligible for deep brain stimulation. And in the right person, it can be absolutely amazing and life-changing but it still does not slow the destruction of those dopamine-producing cells down. 
So we need something better. And the next revolution we're looking at now is neuroplasticity and neuroprotection. And this really is dependent completely on exercise at the moment. There is no medication available currently, although there's lots of trials going on, but there is still no medication available currently that slows your Parkinson's down. There's nothing that is disease modifying. Very good at symptom management, and that's why I'd encourage you to be optimally medicated for Parkinson's, but it's not gonna slow your Parkinson's down. The only thing that we can see at the moment to improve um, the, viability, the viability of those remaining dopamine producing cells is exercise. As amazing as it seems, and as low tech as it seems, that is currently the only way to slow your Parkinson's down, which should provide a very compelling reason why you need to exercise the right way to give yourself the best, best chance. So for those of you that don't know much about neuroplasticity or haven't heard much about it, I want to give you a really brief layman's description of it so that it makes sense to you and, and why we think neuroplasticity underpins everything we do in the exercise program that we've, we've created. So if you look at this um, quick schematic here, you can see the various different stages of foliage. So we've got lush green foliage over here, which would typically be... Um, characterized by lots of branches, lots of leaves off those branches, lots of communication, lots of nutrients, lots of activity going on in the brain. There's something over here where the leaves have started to diminish. There's not a lot of connection between them. Um, and basically what we're seeing here is the contrast of somebody that's exercising well and specific to their Parkinson's and somebody that's become sedentary. And the reason I say this is the brain responds to stimulation provided to it, activity dependent stimulation. So in this case, exercise and physical activity. And if you're not constantly challenging your brain with new and novel activities, um, physical and cognitive, then your brain is really good at pruning back the neural connections and sometimes the neurons that are no longer required. So in somebody that's sedentary, it's, this is why it's accelerating your symptom progression because this is what's happening in your brain. It's a maladaptive process when you're not stimulating your brain sufficiently. The flip side of that is, of course, what happens over here. If you do start stimulating your brain with physical activity, exercise that's challenging and novel, cognitive, cognitive challenges as well, then what typically happens in the brain is you create new connections between the neurons you then start to create new neurons and in a couple of different parts of the brain, that's actually possible to happen as well. So your brain is not hardwired. There's a lot of activity going on in your brain, depending on the stimulation it's provided with. Um, you might even develop um, more vascularization blood vessels to support this ongoing, lush, thriving community and network. And neuroplasticity at its core is your brain's natural capacity to rewire and retrain itself to give you as much optimum movement as you possibly can. And that's why I say when I come back to, you know, don't think that your body has failed you. Yes, you've got Parkinson's and this is what's being done to you. But your body is doing absolutely everything it can to help you move as well as you possibly can. And you need to give it as much help as it can by exercising and stimulating your brain so it knows and is guided in the best way to do that. So... Just to summarise, if you're not exercising and you're, and you're quite sedentary, then this is what we would, we would say is neurodegenerative in behaviour pattern, opposed to somebody that's doing an exercise program that's driving change, creating new, um, new neurons, new networks in the brain, new synaptic connections. Um, that's what we would say is neuroactive. So you've got the two sides of the scale. Um, and I think they're fairly easy to understand and appreciate, but I think what a lot of people don't often recognise is you've got this one sitting in the middle there, which is neuropassive, and this is where most general exercise sits. Now, I'm not saying you go for a walk with the dog or um, even run marathons to stop doing that by any means, because that is excellent for your general health. And I said before, you don't need additional cardiovascular, metabolic or respiratory problems on top of a chronic condition, degenerative chronic condition like Parkinson's. But I think people often overestimate what they're actually doing because neuropassive exercise is not going to change your brain at all. It's not going to change the symptoms of Parkinson's. It's not going to slow your Parkinson's down. Okay, so don't stop doing it. Pilates, yoga, all those sorts of activities. But we need to change the way that you do it so that you can get the biggest bang for your buck with your exercise and your physical activity. And that's why we need to change it to more of a neuroactive approach. All right. Again, as I was saying before, we really support medication at PD Warrior. Exercise is not designed as a, as a replacement for medication. I think if you're not medicated well, 
then you won't be able to get the training effects from your exercise that will actually help to slow your Parkinson's down. So you do need to be optimally medicated with an optimal exercise prescription tailored specifically for you to really give you the best quality of life and slow those Parkinson's symptoms down, okay? But don't think that your medication is going to do that for you alone. Medication is not, all, not enough. Um, it's a really good starting point, but you really need the two, and that is definitely the missing link that we see in traditional uh, Western medicine at the moment is exercise is not advocated enough for um, especially with neurologists at the moment, because that's not what they're looking at. That's not the research they're looking at. And in the defense, fair enough, they've got a lot to deal with with the medication side of things. But together with physical therapists, physiotherapists, we, this is our deal. This is what we know. We know exercise very well, and there's a lot of literature now that supports the role of exercise and its importance. So those things together now will give you the best quality of life. So medication doesn't slow your Parkinson's down. Deep brain stimulation doesn't slow your Parkinson's down. Exercise is currently the only way that we know of to slow your Parkinson's down. And that's in terms of symptom development, symptom progression. But we also think from some of the literature that we're starting to see, although it's not conclusive, that we're protecting the remaining viable dopamine producing cells in your brain as well. All right, now, please take a chance if there's anything that I'm saying, because I do speak quite quickly. If you need me to go over anything or you have any questions, don't hesitate to just pop them in the chat box there. All right, I wanted to show you some of the research as well. I'll just break it down for you as well. So here we've got um, a study that was done back in 2009. But this was one of the first studies looking at this forced use high effort um, exercise. And what they did was put the person with Parkinson's on the back of a tandem exercise bike and on the front of the exercise bike, they had a professional cyclist. It's a bit mean really because I had the person with Parkinson's then needed to keep up with the professional cyclist. So they removed the resistance and it was really just about the revolutions per minute. So essentially the speed of the movement. And they did that for eight weeks. And what they found at the end of that eight weeks of forced exercise, so not just going to the gym and, you know, riding on an exercise bike at your self-selected pace, but really forcing the exercise and the activity, they found improvements in rigidity, which is that stiffness that you might often feel in your movements of 41%. Uh, in tremor of 38% and brady, oh my sorry, oh, sorry I've lost you there, uh, and bradykinesia of, I'm just going to move this chip box out of the way, 28%. I mean, those are significant improvements and that was just from exercise alone with no change in medication. So those are the sorts of um, improvements that people would typically expect after deep brain stimulation. So really substantial improvements just from a forced exercise ex um, program. And over here, we've got um, a secondary outcome measure that they were looking at as well, which was a fine motor control task. So just something like this, literally getting the fingers to tap together. And they had grip, grip time delay. So the amount of time it took for them to grip an object as it dropped through. And then the rate of force production, which is just basically how quickly they could create that force production in that fine motor task. And in that untrained task, because they did at the very beginning of the study and at the very end of the study and nothing within that eight weeks, they found a really significant improvement in the fine motor control, even though it was completely untrained. Yep, Chris, I'll come back to that in a minute. Thank you. Um, so basically what that started to, to show was that forced use has a systemic improvement at the brain. And what they started to show is that that actually changes the electrical activity and the representation of different neurotransmitters within the brain. This is really, really crucial stuff. And this just goes to show how important exercise is and the right kind of exercise for our brains. Our brains thrive on the right kind of exercise, okay? So let me just say over here, the improvement percentages again increase. So over here, at the end of the eight week study, they showed improvements of 41% in rigidity. So this is done on a clinical measure called the UPDRS. Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. This was conducted by blind assessors at the beginning and the end of the study, and the rigidity had improved. So that stiffness, and in Parkinson's, it's either described as cogwheel, so you might re realise, you might feel that it kind of clunks as you go through movement, or it might just be like a really lead pipe movement. That was improved almost by 50%, 41% is significant. The tremor, so in Parkinson's, again, as you'd know, it's that resting tremor, which doesn't typically um, bother function, although it may develop into a postural tremor with sustained movements. That was improved by over a third, 38%. And then the bradykinesia was improved. So that slowness of movement, that small movement that really can interrupt in function, 
can lead to shuffling of gait, um, difficulty with foot clearance, which can lead to tripping, um, poor agility, difficulty with weight shift. That bradykinesia was improved by nearly a third as well. So again, these um, force use improvements are really significant. And like I said before, what you would often see in, in somebody with deep brain stimulation. So that's major neurosurgery versus an intensive exercise program. So fairly substantial improvements, I'd say. Um, hopefully that answered that question there, Chris. Now this study here was done by Jay Alberts and colleagues in 2016. And the reason I bring it up is I just want to showcase again how important exercise is. So they, again, very often they'll use the UPDRS in clinical research trials. So we don't use it clinically normally, but they will for research. And they show here off medication that people were scoring up around 50 um, points, which is um, typically indicates movement that's not working as well. The higher the score, the poorer the movement, the lower the score, the better the movement. And as you would expect on medication, people were moving better. So that would have been levodopa medication of, of what matter past in a Atkinson like that. They were moving a lot better, so their score dropped down. And I think what's really interesting about this study is they did a third group, and again, they remeasured them off medication when you'd expect their score to go up, but immediately following an um, intervention of forced exercise. And you can see here that they're actually scoring better than when people were just on medication. And again, if this doesn't provide you a really compelling argument for the right kind of exercise, then I don't know what it does because this is all about neuro restoration, which is basically when exercise at the right, the right type of exercise at the right intensity restores some of the altered electrical and um, cellular changes within the brain. And we know in Parkinson's that the electrical activity is abnormal, but with exercise, it can be re re um, uh, restored almost to normal values. And there's one thing called the cortically silent period, which I don't need to go into too much, but that is always abnormal in people with Parkinson's and restored almost back to normal values following intensive exercise. So this is changes in the electrical activity within the brain restored to normal values following exercise. So again, it just goes to show how important exercise is, but again, prescribed for you and the type of Parkinson's that you have. All right, and just a really quick um, study. So this was Matthew Sashelli and his um, colleagues, they produced this um, paper in 2018. It caused a lot of, uh, quite a stir. Um, basically, they were looking at non-motor symptoms, so apathy. So this is the general indifference um, that many people with Parkinson's experience, and some of you might know this yourself. So it is different to depression. You can be depressed and still motivated, but if you're depressed and apathetic, that's when you're completely indifferent to your surroundings, your environment, your situation, what's likely to happen. And that's really challenging in Parkinson's because no one can do this kind of exercise for you. You have to be compelled and motivated to do it yourself. Um, but what they showed in habitual exercise users is that the apathy score was significantly um, lower in those that were exercising regularly. Oh, let me just get this chat box out of the way, sorry. And in habitual exercises, the Beck depression score was typically a lot lower as well than the sedentary group. So, you know, nothing that you wouldn't expect, but we haven't had a lot of data around this until recently. So that's why this study created such a stir. So not only should you expect exercise to improve your motor function, we know that it will also improve your non-motor symptoms. Um, and I had a patient from Glasgow email me the other day to say, my sense of smell has come back after the 10 week challenge. Now I can't explain that because sense of smell is related to um, the olfactory bulb, which is in the brainstem and typically one of the first symptoms that people will see with Parkinson, maybe 20 years prior to diagnosis, why sense of smell would be re retained or improved at the end of an intensive exercise program, I don't know, because that would tend to indicate regeneration of that olf olfactory bulb, and I don't know that, but it just goes to show how amazing exercise can be within the brain to actually make significant improvements. All right, so point six is you need to schedule daily exercise. Now, we all need to exercise. The Global guidelines on exercise basically state a minimum of 150 minutes per week, so roughly 30 minutes a day. Um, and that's no different if you've got Parkinson's. It just means that your exercise needs to be tailored specifically to you um, and the type of Parkinson's that you have, the type of um, goals that you have, injury profile, um, 
all those different variations need to be factored into your daily exercise programs. It's really important that you do exercise daily, but I think if you're exercising for general health, then you're really missing a huge opportunity to slow your Parkinson's down um, and tailor your, your exercise program to your impairments and to give you the best bang for your buck. So it needs to be daily, but it needs to be targeted and specific for you. Um, so for those of you that say I already exercise regularly, as I said before, that's fantastic, that's great. Please keep that up. But bear in mind that if it's general exercise, and general might still be running marathons or playing golf or swimming, whatever it might be, if it's not tweaked to be neuroactive, which means it's novel, it's challenging, it's effortful, it's um, powerful, all of the things that we talk about in PD Warrior, then it's probably not as effective for you to slow your symptom progression down. It'd be really good for your general health, but not for your Parkinson's. So just keep that in mind. You might need to just tweak your exercise program. All right, and I wanted to show you some epidemiological data here because we can get a lot of information out of this. It's not causative, so we can't make, um, uh, we can't say this occurred because of that, but what we can look at is, is really broad term, <coughs> sorry, so here we have um, a study that was conducted in 2010 and we had, this was taken from a study of 235,000 people. So really strong data in that respect. And they basically asked people how much intensive exercise they'd done in midlife. So around the ages of 35 to 39, and then how much exercise they've done in the last 10 years prior to that point, of point in time of survey and how intensive that was. And you can see here on the forest plot that those that had done low intensity exercise in midlife and low intensity exercise in the pre preceding 10 years prior to that survey, they were um, uh, right on the, uh, they're about 40% more likely to get Parkinson's disease and be diagnosed with that later, okay? Whereas people that had exercised um, intensively in midlife and then in the preceding 10 years, they actually reduce their risk of Parkinson's significantly. So you can see here, anything over here on this side means a reduction in risk of Parkinson's disease. So if you look at those two extremes, we've got low intensity exercise, which you would lead, which would lead you to think that if you're if you've not exercised intensively in life, that increases your risk of Parkinson's. But the reason why you can't actually be causative in data is to say, well, if you've got Parkinson's, you may not be exercising intensively. So it's a chicken and egg scenario. You don't know. But what we do know is that you can't bank exercise either. So if you've exercised intensively in midlife, but not in more recent times, because this line across here crosses the midline, we don't know. You can't bank your exercise, basically. So you need to maintain exercise intensively long term to reduce your risk of Parkinson's. And even then, we're not entirely sure whether it reduces your risk of Parkinson's or delays the onset of when you actually get Parkinson's. Given that you've got Parkinson's, if you look at the flip side of that argument, then we'd be saying the intensive exercise has a really important role to play. And if it fits with the trend of all the other data I've talked about, again, that, that goes to support a really compelling reason for why you need to exercise intensively, um, but not just intensively, targeted for your um, Parkinson's presentation as well. Now, this was a study conducted in 2015, and this was probably the first study that I've come across that actually showed a proxy for neuroprotection in humans. As I said before, in animal studies, they'll typically autopsy the animal after an intervention to see what's actually happened with that intervention. We don't typically do that in humans. It's not, it's not, um, it's typically frowned upon. So we have to use other measures and we use clinical measures to determine the effect of that intervention. So it's not as strong, it's not as powerful, um, but I think this study was the first to show how strong that exercise response was. So this here, um, basically this study looked at a 24 month period with two one month blocks of intensive exercise conducted over that 24 month period. And what they showed at the end of the 24 months was that the, the group that were doing intervention, 75% um, of them were still on risagiline, which is a MAO inhibitor. Some of you might be familiar with that. Um, Elderpril might be another um, generic name that you might be familiar with, brand name, sorry. 75% of people were still on uh, MAO inhibitors versus only 20% of the control group who were just business as usual, not doing any um, guided exercise program as such. Most of those had moved on to levodopa therapy because the movement had deteriorated sufficiently that they required levodopa therapy. Um, the levodopa increased only significantly, significantly in the control group only, whereas in the, um, 
in the intervention group, very few of them were actually on levodopa therapy. And not only that, not only were they taking less uh, medication with less side effects, their UPDRS scores, remember that clinical measure I was talking about before, they were across the board better 24 months after the program and the intervention had started than they were when they started. And I can guarantee, you know, we've got clients in our gym at the moment that have been there for three four or five years and they're still better five years after starting the program than they were when they started. Now that's not the same for everybody because the subtypes of Parkinson's will progress at different rates as well, but wouldn't you want to give yourself the best chance to slow your Parkinson's down? So this was kind of the first study that showed us the role of exercise and the potential for neuroprotection. Moving better 24 months later in a degenerative condition, taking less medication. Okay, so there's really substantial neuroplastic change that's gone on in the brain. Um, and we talk now about a lot of the researchers looking at all the different um, neurotrophic factors that are released with intensive exercise that are, are said to be very protective in the brain as well. That only is with the right kind of exercise. So point seven is about living brave. So let's just say you've, you've made the commitment, you've done the 10 week challenge, it's really then, as I said before, about living the long game. So it's about living brave, getting back to creating, not necessarily your bucket list, but your brave list. What is it that you want to achieve in life? It's not a dress rehearsal. This is the one shot at living your best life. You possibly can. What is it that you want to achieve and get out of your life? You know, changing your perspective to that growth mindset. What can you do to live your best life possible? So that's about living brave. So, you know, it's not smoke and mirrors. It's um, it's about learning from other people that have gone through the experience, seeing what they've achieved. You know, we've got lots of stories, um, and I'll go through these videos shortly, about what people have achieved. What is it that you want to achieve? And some people, it might be being able to make the bed again because it's become so frustrating and time-consuming that they've avoided doing it, haven't made the bed in the last three years, and lo and behold, they're now making the bed five weeks into the 10-week challenge. Or for some people, it might be, I really want to travel around Europe I've just retired, I've just been diagnosed with Parkinson's and I, there's no way I can do that currently and that's what I want to do. So, you know, it can be lots of different extremes, but it's about creating the goals and your life plan for the long game. And it's really about living brave. So I thought I'd just show you some quick examples. Now, I'm not sure if these videos will play well, but this is Pat. So you can see here her walking's not great. She'd come to see us. She's a stage three. She was working as a theatre nurse, but was about to give up her job because she just wasn't safe in the theatre anymore. She'd fallen three times previously coming to see us and had fractured her hip in one of those falls. So not moving particularly well. And this is Pat at week 12. So not only was she moving better, obviously she looks great, but she stayed on working for another 12 months. Um, and more importantly for her, she went back to playing tennis with a coach, which is what she'd previously given up. And that was her favourite activity. That was her social network. Um, and she was just so proud of herself be to, for being able to get back to playing tennis. Um, now, this is Carol. Now, Carol, stage four. So this is a lady I was telling you about earlier who was falling up to 15 times a day, walking with a walker, required assistance for all activities of daily living, had not done any substantial exercise to date. Now, I've actually cut this video at about a minute 20. So it's taken her about a minute 20 just to get her legs up onto the bed independently. And she still couldn't get into bed on her own. Now, this is after less than 20 minutes. I think this is only about 10 minutes of practicing this specifically. And you can see she just whipped her legs up into the bed. She can now roll and she can get herself up. So what we've looked at doing here is increasing the amplitude, the scale, the effort, the power, really trying to not break it down into single movements, which is compensatory movements, which is what we would have done uh, in traditional therapy, but really trying to increase the, the, the effort, the scale, the amplitude, the power of the movement to make sure that she's independent in doing that. Now, for somebody like Carol, if we came back to, to look at that again tomorrow, she, probably, she wouldn't be as good doing that because it's difficult to retain new and novel tasks with Parkinson's. And that's why when I say it's, it's better if you start this sooner rather than later. The sooner you start, the, the, better, the bigger the gains are going to be and the quicker you'll get them. Whereas in Carol's case, we had to look, work really hard and for a lot longer for smaller gains. So I don't think you can afford to let a day go by, really. Oops. 
Um, just another example, this is Will. He has gone on to walk over 2,000 kilometres. So every year he and his wife Coralie have scheduled in a trip to Europe. They've got the means to do that, which is fantastic. And they've walked six, 700 kilometre treks, you know, over those, um, over those trips and done amazing work in, you know, really helping himself to connect with his wife and also to really make sure that he can do what he wants to be doing. So, you know, he's, you know, he said to me before, you know, I often think if I'm struggling to keep up with Corey and, you know, I just think, okay, what would I do in pity worry? And I reach out and I stride out and I grab my poles and off I go and I can catch up with her. And I mean, you know, these are the things that are really important on an everyday basis for, for individuals. Um, here we've got other individuals, you know, Jen who's gone off to Kyoto and I saw her at the WPC. That was a massive trip. She did a three-week trip with her husband. That was a big um, Brave Lift goal for her. We've got Christine over here who's in Peru doing PD Warrior and she's setting up um, education and training for local physiotherapists over there. That's her Brave List is to, to spread the message to other people over there, to help other people. This is Cindy. She's, she went to Antarctica with her partner, with her husband, Mike, um, and walking through snow up to her thighs. I mean, she, she said, there's no way I would have been medically fit enough to do that if she hadn't had the support around her and the, the right guided exercise from PD Warrior. So I think all these stories are absolutely fantastic, but at the end of the day, it's, it's really important. It's about your story and what is your next chapter going to be about? Um, you know, what is the most important thing? What limits have you set on yourself that you think you can smash through? What are, what are your goals? What are your bucket list goals? Drag those out again. Create that brave list of things that you want to get back to doing. Point eight is relevant. We are hardwired to connect to people. We want, we are social beings. We need to connect to other people. And I think Parkinson's can strip a lot away from you if you let it. So don't let it. And I know a lot of people have created really good, strong friendships and almost said Parkinson's has been the best thing that's happened to them because of this whole new direction that they've gone down and this group of people that they've met. And I think what I see in PD Warrior is it creates this whole new community of like-minded people that want to be the best that they can be, supporting each other, the camaraderie. Um, you know, you need to be accountable to somebody. So you need to rally the troops around your family members, friends, anybody that will support you and give you that, that buddy mentality is really, really important. So strategically think about who those people might be, um, which community you need to, to be part of and really start to connect um, because that will help keep you accountable and keep you doing the exercise program, not just for a 10-week challenge, but beyond that as well. Um, and that's why we've created Tribe 365 as well because we want a global community where people can come together, ask all the silly questions or not so silly questions or just, you know, I've got, uh, you know, the question the other day was about, um, I, I, I've got a lot of drool and somebody said, try pineapple juice and they did and it really helped. So these are the things that I can't typically answer, but the community can. So that's why Tribe 365 was, was created as well. Um, nine is, of course, educate yourself. The more education you have, the more and why you need to do the program the way it's being designed. Um, there's a book available which goes through the, the basic theory behind PD Warrior. There was um, Insight Summit as well. These are a couple of really good opportunities to get good quality information because there's so much information out there on the internet that's not well curated. It requires a lot of interpretation to be relevant and important for you and not alarming or something that will lead you to catastrophize. Um, so the Insight Summit, we run that every year. That runs in April from World Parkinson's Day. It's an online summit, so you can access it from anywhere. This year, we had 60 of the world leading researchers, academics, clinicians, influencers, people with Parkinson's all presenting around what is new in Parkinson's. Um, so make sure that you that out if you haven't seen that before. And then, of course, taking yourself off to lectures and presentation seminars, support groups, um, connecting with that community as well, like I said, in point eight. They're really important. So educating yourself is crucial. Um, and what we do in the 10-week challenge as well is each week you get an education webinar and then we Q&A that in the Try365 so that you can really get those questions answered as well. And 10, point 10, the final one is share the love. I think it's really important that we spread the message about how important exercise is. I've got a colleague over in Canada who is working her backside off to try and share the message about the importance of exercise to neurologists over there in the particular area that she works in. And even now where I live, there are um, lots of wonderful neurologists and movement disorder specialists that will refer directly on diagnosis of Parkinson's so that you can get stuck into exercise programs like this. But it's still not considered mainstream. And it's such a shame because the rewards can be so strong and so powerful 
when um, combined in conjunction with really optimal medication as well. So we know that PD Warrior is effective. It should ex you should exceed your, your expectations is, is what we see in most people. 98% people, of people think it's worth their time and 94% of people continue exercising after the 10-week challenge. And considering sedentary behaviour and lack of physical activity is one of the main things that we're trying to combat, that just ticks both boxes. That just shows success right there. The program is very, very well tolerated, enjoyed, and it's creating people, you know, that, that live brave mentality where people start to create all of these lovely bucket list, brave list goals that they can share for the rest of their life. So I want to say thank you so much for sticking with me for the 10 points. I want to tell you how you can get involved in the 10 week challenge. Um, so stick around for that because we do have a special 48 hour offer and the reason why it's 48 hours is I need you to take action now. As I said before, I don't think you can afford to waste a day. There's so much going on in your brain. If you're not exercising the right way, you're not giving your body, your brain, the best opportunity to slow down. So our mantra is to be brave, train brave and live brave. And that's ultimately going to give you the best day tomorrow. Okay. So, you know, there's a really good quote and I can't attribute to anybody because I don't know, so I apologise, but it goes something like, um, one day there'll be a day when I can't fight, but today is not that day. And I always think about that when I meet people that walk into the door and they're so overwhelmed and not sure where, whether they're in the right spot. And, you know, within a week or less, they're already thinking today is not that day. I am not going to let Parkinson's take me. And I would love you to leave with that mentality and that sentiment. Parkinson's is not going to get you if you don't let it. So you need to do everything you can to try and live brave and train brave to be the best that you can at every stage with your Parkinson's disease. So how can you get started? Well, the first thing I think you need to do is to make the commitment to yourself that you're going to be brave, be courageous, and take that very first step to do a program that is designed specifically to help you and has been used on thousands of people around the world now. So that's a very first step. And you've got 48 hours to think about it with this special offer, but don't leave it any longer, okay? You need to get started on these things right away. If you delay it, apathy, depression, anxiety, they can all kick in and you end up being com completely in outdoor overwhelm and don't do anything. So the first thing is be brave. The second thing is learn how to train brave and that's by doing the 10 week challenge. So the 10 week challenge, we've modeled this on thousands of people. We've gone through various iterations. We're now in PD Warrior 2.0. It's the best version out there. It's the most holistic program. It's well supported with the book, the app, the DVD, the online 10 week challenge, the global community, the insight summit. It's got everything in there that you possibly need to give you the best 10 week challenge to get you back into living your best life possible. Heaps of inclusion, so 12 months access to the weekly exercise video, weekly educational content, weekly motivation to keep you accountable and on track, group and online coaching, depending on what your style is. Um, and it will also give you 12 months access to the Live Brave um, Tribe 365, which is, so I'm just moving the chat box over here. You get guest speakers and interviews and experts talking from their backgrounds community support, and I think this is the thing that has probably blown me away the most. If you're having a day where things are not going right, you're feeling down, the community is there to lift you back up and get you on the horse again. I think it's amazing how supportive the community is, and I think if that's what you're looking for, then that's just, it's just a beautiful thing, and I think it really helps to keep people in the right, in the right mindset and moving forward. Um, obviously, there's daily Q&A and support and discounts in the Brave Shop. So these are all the things that we can provide online with a 10 week challenge. Um, and so thank you for sticking around and for doing that, you get access to the 48 hour special, which I'll share with you now. Um, as I said, it's 40 hour, 48 hours because I need you to take action now. I don't want you to think about it. You, you're just wasting time if you're not doing a program like this. So you'll get 12 months try 365 included in this special offer, which gives you $99 off. Okay, so that's a really substantial saving. So if you hop over to pdwarrior.com forward slash 10 week challenge forward slash online, you'll get this special offer at the moment. So you get all of that, the 10 week challenge, the weekly education videos, the weekly ed exercise videos, try 365 for 12 months, access to me and my trainers on a daily basis. You can have that all for Australian dollars, $279. So it's a cracking deal, gets you started and will get you back into life. And I think 
you know, if you're, if you're value sensitive, it's huge value. Everybody is amazed at the value that's sitting in that program. Um, but I want you to be able to access it. I want you to be able to do it. And I want you to really learn how to train brave so that you can live brave and live your best life with Parkinson's. That's my mission. I want to get in front of as many people as I possibly can with this program to really help improve the lives of everybody with Parkinson's. And we do that through this method. And we also do that by training other health professionals globally. We run about 30, 35 courses a year helping other health professionals learn how to train brave as well. So go and check out that link, sign up to the course. If you have any questions, you can just pop them in the chat box over there now. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or you can just message or email me directly. Um, don't wait though, because now is the time to get started. Today is not that day to delay. Today is go and get started, all right? So this is just a slide to basically show you've got two options here. You've got the option where you go and get started, you do the 10 week challenge or you don't. And I think for many of my patients, it becomes that sliding door moment where, you know, they say to me, God, imagine if I hadn't started this program now. Imagine what I would be sitting down here. I wouldn't have done that trip to Europe. I wouldn't have cycled up the Tour de France. I wouldn't have been able to make my bed anymore. You know, don't let that be you. Don't take the path of least resistance where you don't change. You don't do anything. I'd love for you to come and join us in the 10 week challenge. It starts at the beginning of every month. So that'll be starting. Um, in a couple of days, so please go over, head over and check out the, um, the website. So the link down there again at the bottom is pdwarrior.com forward slash 10 week challenge online or with little dashes there. Any questions, please pop them in the chat box. And otherwise, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure having us, having you all there. Um, and I really wish you the very best. Thank you, everybody.